It is a pleasure to see everyone here this evening. We have some visitors who have come our way to North Beach tonight. It is always good to have visitors here. We have quite a few of our own members that are out sick right now, and we have some others that are dealing with some other issues and are not able to be with us. But I am glad that you are here this evening and that we are able to worship God in this place together. I'd like to encourage everyone to take a Bible, follow along with me as we study from God's Word. And if you have your Bibles handy, I'm going to invite you to find in the New Testament the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. In just a moment, we are going to be in Mark chapter 11 and read some things that are there. You know, if we talk to people around us, whether they be religious or not, and we ask them to kind of paint a picture, if you would, of Jesus, not literally a picture, but if you would kind of describe what you think about Jesus, probably a lot of the people that we talk to would describe Jesus kind of in the way that he is typically illustrated in the world. So if you were to open your browsers, not now, but later, and were to do a search for Jesus and look for the images, you would find a lot of images in which Jesus would have probably pretty long hair. If there's an image of his hands, they'd be very, very soft. And if you had an image of his face, it would be almost angelic. That's how a lot of people envision Jesus. Kind of a little bit soft, kind of a little bit mm, squishy, if you will, if I can use that word. In Mark chapter 11, we read a story about what something that Jesus did that paints a very different picture of who Jesus was. If you are there with me in Mark chapter 11, let's begin reading in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and he, the he there is Jesus, and Jesus entered the temple, began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. We read this particular account here in Mark's gospel, and Mark doesn't record all of the details that the other gospels do. Elsewhere in reading about this, we read that Jesus makes a scourge, he makes a whip, and he's driving the animals out, and he's driving the people out, and he's overturning the tables of those that are there doing business. Certainly not the picture that people typically think about when they envision Jesus. Tonight in the time that we have, I'd like for us to use this story that we read here in, in Mark chapter 11 and spend some time thinking about zeal for God's house. Zeal in this particular case for the temple, but I'm going to suggest to you this evening that we need to take that and apply that in a modern context for us as Christians. Zeal for God's house. So we are there in Mark chapter 11. Let's go ahead and continue reading in verse 18. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching and when evening came they went out of the city I just wanted to finish reading that we see here the zeal that Jesus has for the temple Jesus goes into the temple and he sees all these things going on that should not have been going on in that place he quotes to them from the Old Testament about the fact that the temple was to be a house of prayer but it had been made into a den of robbers and so he does something here that is well quite honestly pretty astonishing that he would do this that he would kind of upend if you will upend what had been going on in the temple, but it shows the zeal that Jesus had for God's house. I would suggest to you this evening that as we consider this, we need to understand that it is important for us to have zeal for God's house as well. Far too often, I think that for us as Christians, we just kind of take God's house for granted. We just kind of take 
the church for granted. We're going to get to that at the end of this lesson so we can make that connection. We just kind of take these things for granted and we don't really have a lot of zeal for them. But when we look at the temple and we look at God's house, there are some things that we need to understand about it. So for example, we need to understand that God's house is holy. Take your Bibles and go with me if you would over to Psalm 26. In Psalm 26... In Psalm 26 and verse 8, notice what David here writes in this psalm. And I will tell you up front that when David is writing this, the temple has not yet been built. So David is referencing the tabernacle, which was the precursor to the temple. That's important because I want us to understand that when we talk about zeal for God's house, it isn't just about a temple that stood in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago and no longer stands today. There is a different idea behind this. So Psalm 26 in verse eight, notice what David writes. He says, Oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We remember this, don't we, from the Old Testament, that in the Old Testament, we see the glory of the Lord, the glory of Jehovah. They're associated with the tabernacle, especially the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. God's presence is felt there. We see later when the temple is built that God's glory moves into the temple. And by the way, when you read in the book of Ezekiel, you see God's glory departing from the temple. The temple was holy. The tabernacle was holy because that's where God made his, made his presence physically known among the people of Israel. And so the temple was a special place. In fact, when you consider how the temple was set up, it was set up in such a way that only certain people could enter certain parts of the temple. And so ultimately in the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, the only person that could go in there was the high priest. And he was only allowed to do it one time per year because there was such holiness associated with the temple of God. In fact, in the New Testament, there was a, there was a barrier around the temple and there was an inscription written. And the inscription warned people that if you were not Jewish, and you went beyond this sign, you had taken your life into your own hands. The Roman authorities pretty much weren't going to intervene if a Gentile went beyond that barrier. They were going to die for what they did, and that was their own mistake. God's house is holy. It is the place, David tells us, where God's glory dwells. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Habakkuk, if you will. Habakkuk chapter 2. This one's a little bit harder to find. Look for those minor prophets there at the end of the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 2. Let's look in verse 20. In Habakkuk chapter 2, and I'm going to give you time to find that. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. This is what we read. But the Lord and you may remember from our series of sermons on Jehovah, you're looking at that word there and it's in funny little capital letters. Jehovah is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The temple was a holy place. The tabernacle had been a holy place. I want you to remember that because God's house is holy. In the Old Testament, it was a physical building. It was a physical tent first, then a physical building. And that place was indeed holy. You couldn't just go traipsing in there and doing whatever you wanted to do. There were things that were used in the temple service that were holy as well. You may remember in your Old Testaments in the book of Daniel, that in Daniel chapter 5, there was a fellow whose name was Belshazzar. And Belshazzar pulled those uh, I don't want to say dishes, vessels. There's our word for it. Pulled those vessels that had been used in the temple, vessels that belonged to Jehovah. And he used them to have this big party in his palace in which he was praising all these pagan gods. And you remember how that ended that night, right? The hand appears and writes on the wall. And that night that king died. Those things were holy to Jehovah. They were his. God's house belongs to him. 
And as such, it is holy. Zeal for God's house. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's look here in verse 5 and notice something else about zeal. And that is that zeal is vital. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Notice what we read here. You shall love... You shall love the Lord your God with half your heart and with a quarter of your soul and with an eighth of your might. Boy, I hope I'm getting some puzzled looks right now. That's not what your Bible say, is it? Let's read that again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your might. In verse 6, we'll just tack that on there as well. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Zeal is vital. When we look at these words that are written here, God demands that we love him with what? God demands that we love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might. Everything that we have. The world would look at that and the world would say, you people are a bunch of fanatics to love God that entirely. Zeal is vital. I think sometimes that we as Christians, because we live in a society that really isn't zealous about anything, have forgotten that we need to be zealous about God. Can I say this? We are coming up on election season. We're already in election season. We got the primaries that are going on and people are talking about this candidate and that candidate and who they're going to vote for and how important that is and how bad this candidate is and how bad that candidate is. Christians get all caught up in that. We talk about those things. Can I say this? Brothers and sisters, if we are talking more about politics than we are about Jesus Christ, we need to re-examine where we've placed our zeal. We need to re-examine where we place what's important in our lives. When we will get out, hold on a second, I don't want you to misunderstand or get mad, but when we will get out and we will get involved in a political campaign or a political party, when we'll allow a candidate to put signs on our front yard, whether they be one party or the other, I don't care which. But we will not talk to others about Jesus Christ and invite them to lectures and singings and worship. Where is our zeal placed? Zeal is vital. We as Christians need to be zealous for God's house. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to the New Testament, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16. In Revelation chapter 3, uh, we're going to actually start reading in verse 15. This is Jesus' letter there to the church in Laodicea. Notice what he says here starting in verse 15. He says, I know your works. I know what you are doing, Jesus says to these Christians in Laodicea. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. If you're in my Revelation class, we're going to talk about this passage, what it means. And if I preach on the seven letters at some point in time in the future, we'll talk about it more in depth. Notice verse 16. Let's just get the overall view. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Here's the Cliff Notes version. The waters of Laodicea were lukewarm waters. They weren't good for anything. They were brought in by an aqueduct and they were so full of minerals that in the ancient world, the waters of Laodicea were used to make people throw up. So if you ate something bad and you needed to throw up, you needed to induce vomiting. You drank some water from Laodicea and that would do the trick. That was all it was useful for. You didn't want to drink that. You didn't want to carry that in your canteen. That was nasty water. There were other waters there nearby, waters that were hot, that were useful, waters that were cold, that were useful. But the people of the church in Laodicea, Laodicea was lukewarm. They were good for nothing. They had lost their zeal. And Jesus says, I know your works. Or maybe we could just say to that, I know your lack of works. 
Brothers and sisters, zeal is vital. It is vital. It is absolutely important to the nth degree that we have zeal for God's house. We look on at this. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to the New Testament. You're already there. So stay in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Look with me, at you, with you, if you will. I'm all uh, caught up in my words tonight. Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. Zeal is expressed in worship and service. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. I love that. We all know what a sloth is, right? It's that animal that moves really, really slowly. There was a movie a few years back, Zootopia, I think was the name of that. The kids will tell me if I've got that wrong. And in that movie, there's a, a really fast rabbit police officer who needs some paperwork from the, the person behind the counter who happens to be a sloth. And that sloth just moves like this and stamps and turns the page and does it again. And the rabbit's just ready to go. And they're held up by this sloth that can't move any faster than that. Paul says what? Do not be slothful in zeal. Don't be lazy about being zealous, if you will. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Remember what we read back in Deuteronomy? In Deuteronomy, it's expressed this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind. Here, Paul says... Be fervent in serving God. Serve the Lord. Zeal is expressed in worship and in service. Take your Bibles and go with me if you would to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, look with me if you will starting in verse 23 and we'll go down to 25. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 the writer says this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. To stir up one another. Stir the pot, if you will. We have that phrase. Stir the pot means make people uncomfortable. If you were stir things up like you would a pot cooking on your stove. Let us consider how to stir up one another, not to strife, but to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Zeal is expressed in serving others. Zeal is expressed in worshiping God. And brothers and sisters, zeal is expressed in worshiping God collectively. I don't really understand. And I know I spoke a little bit about that this morning. I'm going to speak a little bit about it again. I don't really understand why it is that attendance at worship services is such a problem for so many Christians. Unless it is the Laodicea problem. People have become lukewarm. We need to be zealous in serving the Lord. We need to be zealous in worshiping the Lord. It needs to be something that we do because we want to. Because it's important to us. Having said that, something else about zeal that I just want us to note, it's just for a little bit, and that is that zeal can be misplaced. Take your Bibles and go with me to Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, let's look at verses 1 and 2. Paul is talking here about physical Israel. And notice what he says here in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul wants these Jewish folks, physical Israel, to hear the gospel and respond to it. Verse, four, verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The reason I bring this out is because zeal, if we're not careful, 
can be misplaced. We need to be zealous for God's house, but it needs to be zeal that is based on knowledge. Not just some kind of emotional feelings. Zeal can be misplaced and we need to be careful. One last thing this evening that I want to make a point. Because I said at the beginning we kind of wrap all this up and kind of tie this together. That's what we're going to do. It's important for us to understand we talk about zeal for God's house. The temple no longer stands in Jerusalem. The tabernacle is long gone. So when we talk about having zeal for God's house, we need to understand that the church, brothers and sisters, is God's temple today. Look at two verses with me, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Look with me, if you will, starting in verse 19. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19, this is what Paul writes. He says, So then, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That word household means family. You are members of the family of God. Now notice verse 20, the metaphor changes a little bit. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now the metaphor shifts from a family to a building there in verse 20, in whom, verse 21, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. These walls around us, I don't know how many walls we've got. One, two, a lot. Not four walls, can't say that. These walls are not the temple of God. The temple of God. You want to see the temple of God? Look at the people sitting right next to you and behind you and in front of you. And you're looking at the temple of God. It is the church. The church are or is the people. Look with me if you would in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> Peter expresses it this way. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christians today, collectively, the church, form God's temple. So let's go backwards just for a second. I can do that. There we go. And pull up these points again. Remember Jesus' zeal for the temple? Because the temple had been changed. The temple wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And Jesus comes in and sets that straight. Brothers and sisters, the church has a mission. We have a mission our mission is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to worship God. Our mission is to let people know about salvation. If we turn the church into a club, if we turn the church into a place of entertainment, if we turn the church into a social organization, we've missed the purpose of the church. And I can picture Jesus walking through those doors and turning over a few pews and a few tables. God's house is holy as well. The church is holy. It belongs to him. Elsewhere in scriptures, the picture that's given is the picture of a marriage. God is married to his people. My wife is back there on the back pew. Oh, y'all know who she is, Ivana. Ivana is my wife. She isn't anybody else's wife. And that means that I have certain rights, privileges, and obligations in regards to her particularly. And if some guy were to go over and start flirting with her and trying to convince her to run off with him, I'm going to tell you, 
I'm going to be a jealous husband. And that fellow's going to have a problem. God is jealous for his people. And we need to recognize that we belong to him. We're married to him. He's our husband, if you will. Zeal is vital as well. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If I'm paraphrasing that correctly. We need to have that kind of love for God today. We need to have that kind of love for God's church today. Because zeal is vital. And remember the church in Laodicea? Lukewarm. So Jesus says what? You're so lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Brothers and sisters, let us never reach that point in our relationship with Christ. Let us renew the zeal that he expects us to have and do the work that he's given us to do. Zeal is expressed in our worship and service as a church. When we come together in this place, how do we feel about being here? David said, I was glad. When they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Do we come to worship because we have to, or do we come to worship because we want to? And if we don't come to worship because we want to, and we don't come to worship at all, we need to be working on the zeal because this is something that we should want to do. What about serving others? What about service to our brothers and sisters in Christ? What about service to God? We need to be careful with our zeal lest it be misplaced. We can be very zealous for things that Jesus has not given the church to do. Zeal for God's house. What's interesting as I look at that, Jesus does this thing that is seemingly so out of character. So out of character that most people, when they have that statement, what would Jesus do? WWJD used to be on bracelets and things like that. They're not usually thinking of this. They're usually thinking of something else. Jesus demonstrates in this, and by the way, in the Gospel of John, Jesus does it not once but twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry. Jesus says God's house is important. And I'm going to set the record straight. Brothers and sisters, God looks at his church and he says his church is important. His church needs to be zealous for the things of God. I appreciate your attention this evening. If you were looking at your watches and saying, hey, Stephen didn't preach quite as long tonight. You're right. I didn't. I gave you a little bit back. I'll take it some point in time in the future. You can almost guarantee that. But consider these things. This is important for us to think about. Because God cares. And God cares what we're doing as his people. We can't make people respond to the gospel. We can't go out and force people to come in and be baptized in that baptistry. But brothers and sisters, what we can do is give people the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And so if they reject that message, if they reject that possibility, on the day of judgment, they will have no excuse. They will not be able to look at Stephen Baxley or Ron Gray or Tom Ford and say, you never told me because we tried. Zeal for God's house. We're about to sing a song that Josh is going to lead us in. If you were here this evening, that song is, who will follow Jesus? Will you follow Jesus tonight? If you are not a member of his church, that can be taken care of this very night. As I've indicated, there's a baptistry there filled with water. You can be baptized and have your sins washed away so that you can come up out of that water to live a new life. If you need to do that tonight, if you'd like to do that tonight, I'm going to go back to the foyer. The congregation is going to stand and sing. Come back there. See me there. We'll talk together. You can do that now while we stand and while we sing this song.